And if you uh, do have a handout, go with me to Psalm 1. Psalm 1, the very first psalm. Everyone got a handout? Are we covered? Okay, Psalm 1. Just six verses. My goodness, are they powerful. Let's dig into it, shall we? Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Shall we, Father, thank you so much for being the God that you are. Father, help us never to take you for granted. Help us to make you preeminent in our thoughts in our words, in our actions, in our whole life. May our entire being be a daily testimony to the grace that you've shown to us. May we display more than ever in these last days the peculiarity that you have imparted to us as believers to be different from the world around us. And Father, just as this psalm has such a clear demarcation between the godly and the ungodly, the blessed and the unblessed. Help us, Father, to be clearly different from the world around us, that others, when they see us, when they hear us, when they watch us, they will know that we're different. Father, I pray that you'd put an inquiry into their heart, a curiosity into their heart to wonder what it is that's different about us. I ask, Father, that you would help us to be so salty that we would make other, others thirsty for you. May your will be done in this message this morning, Father. May the words, the thoughts be yours. May you be lifted up. May all be drawn to you. May you increase as the rest of us all decrease. May you be glorified, I ask, not only through the message but through our actions and responses to it afterwards, for we ask it all in Jesus' name. And for his sake and with thanksgiving, amen. We're talking about the, the blessed life, a life that is blessed. And I'm assuming as I stand here before you today talking about this, that you want to live a blessed life, that you want to live a godly life. Otherwise, you would have slept in more than you did today, right? You probably didn't sleep in much at all. I mean, most of the world around us sees this as a sleep-in day, right? Uh, sleep in, have brunch somewhere maybe, read the paper and just uh, wait for the games to start at noon or one o'clock or whatever time they, leave, they start, start up. That's what most people do with their Sundays. But you're here. It means that you want to know more about how to live a blessed life, and I commend you for that. You are in the vast minority of people on this planet. Do you realize that? That makes you in itself peculiar, right? Which is what we're supposed to be. But we want to talk about how to live a blessed life. What makes it different from everybody else? Well, I'm reminded of a story about a young paratrooper. Went through paratrooper training in the Army, I think Fort Benning, Georgia, or someplace. And, and they were uh, going up for their first jump. And all the soldiers had been given instructions before they jumped. This one particular fella I'm talking about the, uh, got the four instructions. The first instruction was, Jump when you're told to. When the green light comes on, the jump master says, go, you go immediately out that door. And then the second instruction was count to 10, and then pull the ripcord. Instruction number three, if your chute doesn't open, pull the other ripcord and wait for the chute to open. Instruction number four, a truck will be waiting on the ground to take you back to the base. So they all had to remember those instructions. 
So all these guys lined up when they got to altitude. They're lined up at the door. Jump master's at the front of the door. One after the other, they all clipped into this line overhead. And they watched the light. Finally, it turned on and, and, and turned green. They got to the place where they're supposed to jump. The jump master started saying, go, 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 go. And everybody, one after the other, out the door. This young man did as he was told. He went out the door. And he started counting. One, two, three, four, five, six. A little, probably a little faster than he was supposed to. He got to ten. He pulled the rip cord. And he waited. Nothing happened. No shoot. So he said, okay, step number three. Pull the other rip cord. He said, pull the other rip cord. No shoot. He's thinking, oh, boy, things are going great. I bet there won't be a truck waiting to take me back to base when I get to the ground either. You know, some things don't always work out for us in life, do they? Now, I, I've said this many times before, and it's, it's still true. When I, when, I, when I first got saved, um, of course, I didn't realize for a little while exactly what I did. It wasn't until I started going to Bible study and learning more about the Bible that I understood really what salvation was. I mean, I know I, I, I read the gospel and the tract. I prayed the prayer. I, I, I believe God saved me that night. Uh, but I didn't f understand the full ramifications of what it meant to be saved. But as I uh, learned more about what the Christian life was, I started thinking, well, things are going to go really well the rest of my life. I mean, I'm, I'm a child of God. God has saved me. He's given me abundant life now, eternal life later. I'm going to have a home in heaven. Uh, life is going to be great. But you know what? I think they lied to me. It wasn't that great. I mean, things got rough for a while. And I've used this illustration many times, and I, I remember thinking of it at the time, and it's still true today. I, I thought that life would be a bed of roses when I became a Christian and started living for the Lord. And I started thinking, well, maybe it's not a bed of roses. And then as I thought about it more, I thought, well, you know what? I've never laid down on a bed of roses, but I bet I, if I did, there's going to be thorns down under there somewhere that are going to stick into me everywhere. And that, that's, that's a pretty good illustration, I think. Because life for a believer is no better than a life for a non-believer, except that you don't go through anything alone. The Lord goes through it with you. So if you want to learn how to go through these things and land on your feet, as so many other people do, have you noticed that there's a lot of people who have the same problems that you and I do, but they always seem to land on their feet, they get through stuff very, very well, very smoothly? Then there are others who have a really rough time with it, and don't seem, seem to know how to deal with this situation, that situation, that crisis, that tragedy. The difference is what we talk about in this psalm. This psalm doesn't talk about two different kinds of people. One lives a, 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 a life with no problems, and the other one's life with problems. No, they both have problems, but one is blessed, the other one's not. This, this psalm bifurcates neatly into two sections Three verses in the first half, three verses in the second half. The first three verses talk about the man who is blessed, the person who is blessed. The second three verses talk about a person who is not blessed. So let's just dive right in. Your first blank, the person who is blessed, verses 1 through 3. And this, sec this breaks down into two sections. First, what the blessed person shuns. What the blessed person shuns. What they avoid. <coughs> And under, under that, you've got three blanks. These are things that the blessed person, the person who's going to live a blessed life, avoids at all costs. First, they walk not in the counsel of the ungodly. Walk not in the counsel of the ungodly. What that means is we don't follow the advice of people who don't follow the Lord. It's really just that simple. The people who don't follow the Lord are all around us. We live in a world filled with over 7 billion people, the vast majority of whom do not follow the Lord. We should not listen to those folks when they give us counsel and advice or impart their worldview to us, their philosophy of life. And sometimes they don't even have a philosophy of life. I was telling this story this week. I, I think I told you about it years ago, when, not long after it happened, but I think eight or nine years ago is when I told this story to you last. There was a young man, I believe he, lives in, uh, he lived in either, either uh, well, I want to say California or Nevada. 
He was in his 30s, very healthy, very stable, seemed like, I'm going to use the word stable, but in the moment you're going to wonder why I use that word, a uh, young man who was an atheist, devout atheist, uh, considered himself a free thinker, a rational person, very devout atheist, and just felt like there was no purpose in life in his 30s. And so he made this YouTube video in two parts, because at the time, YouTube would, would not allow you to post more than 10 minutes in a video. So he had two videos, each about 10 minutes long, just under 10 minutes each. So a total video of about 20 minutes explaining why he was going to commit suicide the next day. He made it for his family and his friends, and very reasonably, cheerfully, even jokingly at times, he's trying to explain to them, listen, I, I, I'm not mad at anybody. I don't, I'm not blaming anybody. I don't want you to blame yourself. Uh, I, I just feel like there's no purpose to life. There's no point in going through it anymore. And this guy wasn't going through any tragedies. He had not lost a girlfriend or a job. He wasn't in bad health. He, 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 he had no issues, none, except that he just didn't think there was any purpose to life and saw no point in going on. And as he explained in this video, he wasn't looking forward to going to a better life somewhere. He thought he was just going to end. That would be it. Eternal oblivion. That's what he was expecting. So he made these two videos. He signed off, and I actually showed one of them right after he made it, after it was posted. I, I think I showed the second half of it. It was nine minutes and something long. I don't know if you remember it or not. It's not on YouTube anymore. His family took it down. But... He made that video, and then he posted it, and within minutes of posting it, he killed himself before anybody could stop him. He didn't want anybody to try to stop him. But that is an example of what I'm talking about with the philosophy of the world around us who believe that there's no point to life. There's no purpose to our existence. And an increasing number of people believe that when we die, there's nothing that happens. There are even some religions and cults that teach that, that when you die, nothing happens. You're no more conscious than this table right here. And there are people that buy into that and think they can do whatever they want to in life. They can do whatever they want to to other people. And then when they die, they feel like they've escaped justice. That's what happens to a lot of these mass shooters. Have you noticed that? They kill all these people, then they kill themselves before the police can get to them because they think they're escaping justice. What a tragedy. They face God's justice the instant they pull that trigger. But there is that philosophy that there is no purpose to life. Why should we listen to what the world teaches? We should not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. And let me say this too, we should not let ungodly Christians drag us down either. There are many who claim the name of Christ, yet who don't act like children of God. They don't live like children of God. They don't talk like children of God. Why should we let those folks drag us down spiritually as well? You know, it doesn't work the other way. When you hang around with someone who's, who's not living for the Lord, you're not going to bring them up. They're going to drag you down. It always works that way. Always. Ungodly will, people influence your thinking. They'll influence your words. They'll influence your values. They'll influence your actions. Because we are followers by nature. We are sheep. God calls us that continually throughout the scripture. We are sheep. We are followers. All of us are followers naturally. I'll talk more about that in a, here in a little bit. In fact, I'll show you a very interesting video that, it, that demonstrates that here in a little bit. But why would we want to listen to what somebody else says or advises? If you're, if you're wanting God's blessings on your life, you should listen to what God has to say and follow his advice. So the second one, not, the blessed person shuns not only the counsel of the ungodly, but also the way of sinners. We should not stand in the way of sinners. The blessed person, the blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners. And I hope that none of us are doing anything that stands in the way of sinners, that prevents anybody from coming to the Lord. You know, it's possible for us to do that. 
um, I'm taking a class right now, and that's what the whole class is about. It's about uh, Christianity in the marketplace is what it's called. The marketplace is all around us. You know, like Paul stood in the marketplace on Mars Hill in Athens and preached the gospel. That's what we are all doing every day. We're in the marketplace. We're in the economy. We're working. We're in the. We're in the. Uh, we're working a job, or we're working. We're, we're going where somebody else is working a job. When we go to a restaurant, we are in the midst of their job. We are in the marketplace everywhere we go. And everything we do and say needs to help bring others to Christ, right? Not to drive them away. Someone wiser than me said many, many years ago to me, they said, we are either a stepping stone or a stumbling block to those around us. Every one of us, we're either a stepping stone or a stumbling block to them coming to Christ. Not every Christian or not every person who calls themselves a Christian actually lives for the Lord. Or some who think it's okay to drink and party. Some think it's okay to have sex with somebody they're not married to. Some think it's okay to tell dirty, dirty jokes or use cuss words or listen to those who tell them dirty jokes and use cuss words around them. But you know, I wonder if, if, uh, if people feel comfortable talking that way around you, how salty are you? We need to be uh, Christians in an obvious way where other people feel uncomfortable talking that way around us. If people feel uncomfortable talking that way around me, my first indication is not that, I have, not that they have a problem, but that I have a problem. There must be something wrong with me that they feel okay talking that way around me. I must not be salty enough. <clears throat> so we need to demonstrate Christ to everyone we come in contact with. The third thing you see here, a blessed person not only shuns the counsel of the ungodly and the way of sinners or the standing in the way of sinners, but also the seed of the scornful. We need to avoid that, that position as well. And have you noticed the, the, uh, the, the way this progresses? Uh, walking, standing, and sitting in verse 1. Walking in the counsel of the ungodly, standing in the way of sinners, or sitting in the seat of the scornful. What does a scornful person do? Well, this is a person who's constantly negative, a person who sees the problems before they see the solution. This is a person who, doesn't, uh, who, who questions God's word instead of trusting it, um, not looking for contradictions, assuming that the apparent contradictions are, can be worked out somehow, uh, a person who asks questions to investigate the word of God, not questions to try and bring the word of God down, as the scribes and the Pharisees did with Jesus' ministry. They would ask him questions not because they wanted answers, because, but because they were trying to catch him in something. This is what we're not to do. We are not to be scornful, doubtful, scoffers. The scripture says in the last days, there were many who will come scoffing, asking, where's the promise of his coming? You guys have been talking about the second coming forever. It's been thousands of years now. He still hasn't come back yet. He's not coming back. When are you going to get over it? That's what they say to us. Make no mistake, he's coming. He's patient. He's giving every person every opportunity possible to come to him in repentance and faith, to receive salvation through Jesus Christ, forgiveness of sins, a restoration of the relationship that God intended for them. God wants every person to be saved. He's not going to put the, the offer of salvation out there and say, okay, uh, one, two, boom. I didn't even get to three. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end it all and, and, and be done with all of you and, and just take the few who trusted me in the short time the offer was made available. No. Salvation is a limited time offer. But God's limited time is not our limited time. He's given us 2,000 years so far. If you haven't gotten saved yet, don't push it. I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, trust that tomorrow is coming. Things are moving very, very quickly in the world around us toward that final conclusion that we read about in the book of Revelation, that we see paralleled in the book of Daniel. Countries around the world are banding together to form a united economy that is predicted in the book of Revelation. It's unprecedented in world history. There's all kinds of signs of the end time, I mean the end of the end times, the very end of the end of the end times. We are very, very close to the coming of the Lord. We cannot take any more time for granted. 
But we've talk, been talking about what the blessed person shuns. Now let's talk about what the blessed person shares. What the blessed person shares. And under that, you see another blank. That's the delights of God's Word. The delights of God's Word. In Psalm 119, verses 97 through 104, Psalm 119 is the longest chapter in the Bible. It is all about the Word of God. Almost every verse in that psalm, 176 verses, almost every verse talks about the Word of God. Right there in the heart of your Bible, you, if you take your Bible, unless you've got a study Bible with a lot of notes in the back end, uh, you, you open it right in the middle, it's going to take you right to Psalms. Real close to this chapter right here, to this psalm. And it says this, Oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day. Thou through thy commandments hast made me wiser than mine enemies, for they are ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for thy testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the ancients, because I keep thy precepts. I have refrained my feet from every evil way that I might keep thy word. I have not departed from thy judgments, for thou hast taught me. How sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through thy precepts I get understanding. Therefore I hate every false way. God's word is rich. It is pure. It is powerful. It is eternal. We need to, we need to bask in it. We need to permeate our whole being with the word of God. We should be in it every day, reading it. I would say memorizing it, but I, do, I, don't, I don't personally memorize Scripture. I don't try to do that, <clears throat> but I, because I, I think if you read it enough, it will come to mind. The Holy Spirit will bring the verses to mind as you need them. I don't know that you need to just memorize them, although I'm probably the only preacher in the world who ever says that. Uh, you probably should do that too. But we, if we read it and we think about it, we meditate on it, I think it will stick. I really do. And the word meditate is in there. How do you meditate on the Word of God? Night and day. How do you do that? Well, it's easy. You read the Word of God, close your eyes, and read it again. With your eyes closed, what I'm saying. Read the Word of God, close your eyes, and read it again. It'll stick. Trust me. It'll, it'll stick. Because what you put in this computer will stick there, just like the information you put in a computer like the one back there where Carl's sitting. Once it's on that hard drive, it's there until you take it off. Once it's in here, it'll stay there, right? Good morning. Okay, just wandering there. Okay. <clears throat> uh, a couple of, of uh, Canadians took a trip to Ottawa, uh, the capital of Canada, and went there to visit the Canadian National Mint, where they make all the money, just like the uh, Bureau of Engraving and Printing uh, in Washington, make prints money, and we have mints in different places like Denver and Philadelphia and stuff like that, and make the coins and, and things like that. They do this in Ottawa, Canada. And so this couple was going through there, and they were, get, they were getting a tour of the uh, engraving and, and printing plant, and on display in the lobby were five coins, five special gold coins. These coins were special for a couple of reasons. Um, you and I might have coins with the, that are pennies and nickels and dimes and quarters. Maybe you have half dollars. Rarely you might see a silver dollar. But we don't have coins that go higher than that. These coins, these Canadian gold coins, were $1 million each. That was the denomination, a million-dollar coin. There was only five of them. You've got to be real careful about using coins like this in a vending machine, right? So... They were on display there, and so the couple asked the, the, uh, the guy, the, the guards and the guides there in the lobby, uh, what's so special about these coins? And the, and the tour guide was very excited when he told them that these are the, your purest gold coins that have ever, ever been minted. They're called 5-9 coins because they're 99.999% pure. That's 5-9s, 99.999% pure gold. It's the, the purest that anybody's ever come across. Uh, and so there's only five of them made. I say that because we're talking about the Word of God. The Word of God is purer than that. 
It is the Word of God. It is the revelation of God to His creation. It is the fact that we have a God, we serve a God, not like any other God that's worshipped anywhere else on the planet at any time in human history. Our God made the, the world and made us in the world and loves us so much, He wants us to know more about Him, about the world in which we live, how He thinks, how He operates. He is communicating with us. It is richer than gold, and it's purer than gold. There are no mistakes in it. You can trust it. Every word of every sentence, of every paragraph, of every chapter, of every book of the entire Bible. You can trust the whole thing. It is purer than, than, than the, the soap. Was at 99 and 44 one hundredths percent pure? So, so pure it floats, they used to advertise them. This is far purer than that. The Word of God can be trusted. I wouldn't trust anything else. And as I've said many times, don't trust me. Don't trust any preacher you hear anywhere unless you compare what they say with the Word of God. Just like the people at Berea, just south of Thessalonica, they, they were more noble, the Scripture says, because they compared what the Apostle Paul said with what the Word of God taught. Think about that. This is the Apostle Paul, for heaven's sake. If he were standing here in front of us, I would immediately sit down, shut up. I would listen to every single word he said. It'd be pure gospel to me. But they, even with him, they compared what he said with the Bible. Folks, you can't go wrong if you do that. You'd be amazed if you realized how many untruths you hear from those who claim to be teaching you the word of God. And I'm going to say this. That includes me. There have been many, many times over the years where I have had to correct my teaching and preaching, my views on, on certain things, because I found out later, hey, you know, my view on that wasn't exactly correct years ago. We are all learning more about the Lord and more about His Word. And I'm going to maybe surprise you with this statement. We will continue learning throughout eternity. This is one of the things that makes heaven heaven. We're going to constantly be learning. When we get to heaven, we're not going to instantly know everything. It's going to be a process of learning. We'll sit at Jesus' feet like Mary did and ask him questions. Ask him about all the things that are not in the Bible. This, this is stuff that pertains to us. It's what we need to know. But there's a whole lot more that we'd like to know. And so those are the things that we're going to be learning throughout eternity as well. But always compare what you hear with God's Word. Whether you hear it from the pulpit, whether you hear it from CNN or Fox, whether you hear it on Christian radio or Christian TV, whether you read it in books or magazines, everything that you see, everything that you hear, compare it with the Word of God. Always. The second thing, the blessed person shares in meditating in God's Word. Meditating in God's Word. I just talked about that a minute ago. Read the Bible, close your eyes, and read it again. Joshua 1.8 tells us, it tells Joshua, but it applies to us, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. Now, what he's talking about is we need to talk about the Word of God also. We need to share it with those around us, which means we need to know it, right? Right? And we need to share it with people who are less inclined than we are to pick it up and read it. So this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night. Now, how do you do that? How do you meditate in it at night? Well, I'm never going to get any sleep. I think, and, and studies will bear me out with this, the last thing you do before you go to sleep is what you think about all night long. Which may be why you're having nightmares. But it's true. And I learned this many, many years ago when I was, I think I was still at Ohio State learning psychology, I think when I learned that. And when I became a Christian, I started reading my Bible the last thing before I go to sleep at night. Many people read it first thing in the morning, and I think that's a good idea too. My wife does that. She reads first thing in the morning when she wakes up. I read the last thing uh, before I go to sleep because I, I've got, I'm of the opinion that that stays in you. 
and your mind keeps working all night long. Shall meditate therein day and night that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. In other words, we don't just read it to read it. We read it to do it. Isn't that what James says? We're not to be like those who look into a mirror and look at ourselves and forget what we saw as soon as we walk away from the mirror. We need to look into the perfect law of liberty, which is what the Word of God is, and we need to do something about what we just read. Psalm 119, verse 18, same psalm we read a minute ago. Open thou mine eyes, David said, that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. Wonderful, and a wonderful verse to repeat in a prayer just before you read the Word of God. Ask the author of the book you're about to read to teach it to you. James 1.22 is the, the passage I just read a moment ago. I did, did I put it? Yeah, I, I don't think I put it on your handout. Uh, James 1, 22 through 25 is the verse I just uh, uh, talked about with, the, with the, uh, the mirror, looking at ourselves in a mirror, and the Bible is a form of mirror as well. But let's go on to the next point, what the blessed life is like, what it's like. First, it's like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. You know, that sounds suspiciously to me like the tree of life described in Revelation chapter 21 and 22. The tree of life there planted by the river of life bears fruit every month. The leaves don't wither. We can be fruitful that way as well. And we are to bear fruit. But this is talking about a tree that is cultivated. It's well planted. It's purposefully planted right where it needs to be. God puts us where we need to be, doesn't he? I know it's hard for some of you because you work in an environment where you might be, and many of you are, the only Christian where you work. That makes it difficult for you. I understand that. You've got pressures all around you every day from those around you wanting to influence your thinking or your behavior or your actions. But God has placed you there for a reason. Think of yourself as a missionary to where you work or where you live, the circle of friends that you have. God has placed you there for a specific purpose. You are the testimony to those folks. God has scattered us abroad like seeds uh, in, in the world around us, in the workplace around us, in the marketplace around us. Everywhere we are, each of us are like little seeds or like little lights or like grains of salt, however you want to want to talk about it. The Word of God describes all of those different things. We are all to influence our personal circle of friends, family, co-workers, and neighbors. Second thing, the blessed life is like, it's, it's fruitful, a fruitful tree. John chapter 15, verses 7 and 8, if you abide in me, Jesus said, and my words abide in you. This is talking about uh, abiding is, is permanent residency, okay? It's not temporary. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Now, this is, a, this is a bona fide promise, but remember, it's conditional, as most of God's promises are. If you do this, if you do that, I will do that. You can get what you want if your will matches God's will. If you abide in him, and his words abide in you, then what you ask for is going to be what Jesus asked for, right? Right? And isn't that what we're supposed to do? We're supposed to ask in Jesus' name. That's not tagging a prayer by saying, in Jesus' name I pray, amen. That's not praying in Jesus' name. Praying in Jesus' name means I'm asking in his authority, by the authority of Jesus Christ. I'm asking for what he would ask for. Then he says, and it shall be done unto you, herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit so shall you be my disciples or followers. And he goes on to say, the blessed life is a leaf, a tree whose leaves don't wither. A tree whose leaves don't wither. In other words, a, a person who's living this blessed life, living for the Lord, is not going to fall away or give up or quit. John says this in the first book of 1 John chapter 2, verses 18 through 19. He says, little children, it is the last time. And as you have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now there are many Antichrists, whereby you know that it is the last time. They went out from us, but they were not of us. 
For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us, but they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. This is October, and many years in October, I preached a series called Scary Scriptures. If I were to do that this month, and I'm not, but if I were to do that, this would be one of those scary scriptures. Those who seem like they're Christians, they jump in and they're, all of a sudden they're gung-ho and they want to do this, they want to do that, they want to sing, they want to teach, they want to they serve here, they want to serve there, do all this stuff, and then they flame out after just a couple months. This verse talks about those folks. It talks about folks who we thought were Christians, and they seemed like it for a while, but then they just kind of disappeared. They kind of burn out. Now, I'm not a judge, okay? Only God knows who really is saved and who isn't. When it comes right down to it, you don't know if I'm saved. I don't know if you're saved. Only you and God know. Only I and God know, right? So we can't point the finger and say, well, according to that, this person's not saved. This person's not saved. We can't do that. But we do have an indication that not everybody who claims to be saved is saved. And sometimes their actions demonstrate that. If they didn't stick, it doesn't mean they lost their salvation. That can't happen. That's very clear in Scripture. You cannot lose your salvation if you are saved by grace. If you are saved by grace through faith alone, you cannot be lost by works. It doesn't work that way. Now, if you think you're saved by works, yeah, you can lose it by works because you never got saved in the first place. You can't get saved by works. But if you're saved by God's grace, him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. He that heareth my word and believeth in him that sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life, John 5, 24. You can't lose your salvation. But if you fall away, if you fall away in many cases, it indicates that they were never saved in the first place. Now, there is such a thing as backsliding. That also comes into, into, the, into play there. But those folks either get right or they get killed. <laughs> if, they, if they backslide long enough, um, there is a sin that leads to death. That's another topic for another time. Next blank. Whatever he does will prosper. Whatever he does will prosper. We read this verse earlier, Joshua 1.8. Let me read it again. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written down or therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Right now, I sound like Joel Osteen, don't I? Okay. <clears throat> Let's all start a business. Uh, we'll, we'll read the Bible every day, and we're all going to be rich and famous, right? That's not what he means by prosperous. There's other ways to prosper. I was telling someone this week, I said, if you can go through your whole life, and I'm, I'm 67 and a half, if you can go through your whole life and get to 67 and a half and, and, and count five friends, that you can depend on for anything, who will always be there no matter what for you, and you're always there for them no matter what, you are extremely wealthy. Five. Just five. And you know what? I don't have five. That wasn't personal. <laughs> I'm talking about somebody you can tell anything to. That, that they will always be there no matter what. And you will always be there for them. I'm talking about friendship is a two-way thing, right? Two-way thing. But that's what he, it's one of the things he's talking about, that thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Success is achieving goals. What kind of goals? Not material goals. It's not being financially independent by the time you're 30 having a big house with a four-car garage and three vacation homes, 
retiring at the age of 45, that's not success. I can, I can list a whole bunch of people who have achieved all those things, had the big homes and all the cars and fame and wealth and killed themselves. That's another message for another time too. That is not success. This is success and prospering. But let's go to point number two. The ungodly person, the person who is ungodly, verses four through six, this person is like the chaff. You know what chaff is? For those, in, in, of course, the readers of, of the Bible, they lived in an agrarian economy. They were all farmers, and they would uh, harvest wheat, for example. Uh, you know, those long stalks with a little bit of grain at the top, and what they would do is they'd put that on a rock, and they'd take their donkey and, and walk all around it and break the, the, the head off of the stem and, and, and just get that little grain, which was heavier. And they would, they would take a winnowing fork and throw it up in the air in a, in a stiff breeze, and, and the chaff would blow away over here because it's lighter, and the grains of wheat would fall down directly down here. That's what they would gather up and grind into wheat. The chaff just blew away. And the ungodly are like that chaff. They blow with the wind. Whatever the current thought is, whatever conventional wisdom is, whatever political correctness is, they blow with the wind. Christianity is constant. The Bible never changes. God never changes. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever, Hebrews 13, 8, right? But those without Christ, they blow with the wind. It used to be the law of the land in this country that slaves were property, not people. That was the Supreme Court of the United States who decided that. And that's what people believed. They blew with the wind. If you believed the Bible, you didn't believe that. It is the law of the land today, decided by the United States Supreme Court, that if you are not born yet, you can be killed with no repercussions. Abortion on demand, essentially. And in some places, if the abortion is unsuccessful, they can wait and let you die after you're born. That's where we're going, folks. That's where we're at. It is legal in the United States. And there are many people, including people who call themselves Christians, who think it's okay because the Supreme Court said so. They're not going by what the Bible says, which does not change. And God can call people to preach before they were born. He, he must think they're people. Because I don't think God calls anybody but people to preach. Now, if I'm wrong in that, correct me. But people are influenced by other people. Remember when I said earlier, people are sheep? Followers? Let's play that video. This is an interesting video about how people are easily influenced by others. Watch and listen. Isn't that amazing? But that's a pretty clear demonstration of how we as people follow other people, even though we don't know why we're doing it. And what I'm saying is that that can happen to us with the world around us who are doing things that they don't know that they are doing because they were taught that. Everything from abortion to uh, gender identity to evolution and everything else that the world teaches, people buy into it throughout the, the, the culture that, which, which we live in, the worldview that is presented to them. But we as believers need to be, didn't I already say it a couple times, peculiar. We need to be different. We need to get our worldview from the scripture. We need to get our views and our thoughts from God. That's why Saul, uh, not Saul, uh, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, right? Be not conformed to this world. That's a commandment. That's an expectation. We're not to be like the rest of the world. We are to be like God. We need to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Why? So that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and holy will of God, an acceptable will of God. So we need to be like God. So we, we should, uh, the person who's ungodly is like the chaff, next blank, cannot stand in the judgment. They cannot stand in the judgment. That is when the judgment comes, I'm talking about the great white throne judgment of, uh, of the Lord, 
a judgment day, we call it, in the last half of Revelation chapter 20, they will not be able to stand. God is jealous, the scripture says in Nahum 1, verses 2 and 3, and the Lord revengeth, the Lord revengeth and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries, and he reserveth wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked. The mountains quake at him, and the hills melt, and the earth is burned at his presence, yea, the world and all that dwell therein. Who can stand before his indignation, and who can abide in the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire, and the rocks are thrown down by him. Folks, that's a frightening day. There's your second scary scripture of the day. I don't want to be able to have to, have to stand at that, at, before God at that judgment. That's why I became a Christian. That's why become, I became a believer. I switched sides. I want to be on the winning side. I don't want to be on this side. I don't want to have to face God's wrath. And I don't have to now that Jesus Christ faced God's wrath for me. He did that for you. If you've never trusted him as your Savior, today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. And I encourage you to do that. One more blank and we're done. The person who is ungodly will not stand with the righteous. Will not stand with the righteous. We cannot stand in the judgment. He will not stand with the righteous. They will not stand with us now, and they will not stand with us in the Lord's kingdom. They will not be there. Now, folks, there may be somebody in this room who fits into this category, but I'm also thinking of the ones who are not here, your loved ones, your friends, your neighbors, your co-workers, who you know do not know the Lord. You and I will be on the other side of this judgment I just described, and we will watch them suffer the eternal vengeance of God. It's not going to be a happy day. We need to share our faith with others in the time that's remaining to us. But you and I, we need to stand for the Lord. We need to live the first three verses of this psalm out before others so that they can transfer from the last three verses of the psalm to the first three verses of the psalm. I'm going to ask you to stand with your heads bowed and your eyes closed. I don't know what the Lord's doing in your life, what he wants to talk to you about. But I want you to listen to the Holy Spirit. When he beeps, we need to stand. When he calls us, we need to respond. And when he guides us, we need to follow. Father, may your will be done in these next few moments. May our responses honor and glorify you as you speak to us. Father, help us to be mindful of who we are, who we represent every day, everywhere. For we ask it all in Jesus' name, for his sake, with thanksgiving. Amen. Whatever the need, you come as we sing. We'll show you the answers to your questions from the Word of God. We'll pray with you if you want us to. You don't have to. And if you have something you, you need to handle it there in your seat, you can do it there in your seat or come up to the altar. But I'm going to ask, if you, if you never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, please come. We'd love to talk to you about that.
be seated for just a moment. Just uh, one quick announcement, really, and, and that has to do with <coughs> the service this coming um, Friday with Ed, Brother Ed Weckerman. Um, we're uh, sorry. <coughs> the, uh, the 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 uh, visitation is at 10 o'clock right here at the church. Service at 11 o'clock right here at the church, and they'll be going to the cemetery and then coming back here afterwards for dinner. And if you'd like to help us with the food, what time do we need the food here? Noon? Okay, if you can have food here by noon, that would help us feed the family and friends uh, in the connector immediately after the, uh, we get back from the, uh, from the cemetery. But uh, we, want to, um, we want to take care of that and take care of the family as best we can and pray for them this week also. It's going to be a difficult week. So, anything else? You do? The service is over. You knew that, didn't you? Morning, folks. I always hate to come up here because I'm the guy that's got the good news and the bad news. I'm going to give you the bad news first. Somebody that's so much smarter than us in this world has came up with the thing that we are going to, we're going to appreciate our pastor once a month. So the rest of the month, he's kind of be on his own. And if, uh, you know, if you run into him or something, or if you call him and he does a good deed for you, you can thank him. So I am going to do some calling next week, and I'm going to call some important people, and I'm going to ask them to make everyone come to church. It's going to be your special day. And when you come, you bring somebody with you, and we're going to give you a nice gift. The rest of the year, if you happen to bump into us, we may give you a piece of paper or shake your hand. Folks, listen, this is not the way this world is supposed to be working. We've had four pastors here at this church, and I have worked with all four of them. And I'll tell you, those pastors and their wives, they work 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They don't have a day off. Even if they go someplace, they've got a phone and people can call them. So what we need to do Two of our pastors have already gone to heaven with their families. We can't thank them anymore. Brother Vic has moved away to a different church, and we might see him once a year and we can thank him. But this guy and his family, they're here seven days a week, 365 days a year. Now, one of these days, he's going to be laid out here. You people are going to be crying and begging and telling what great things he's done. That's too late. We need to do that today. Every, my, one of my thoughts is it's not a sin, but listen, if somebody does something for me and I don't thank them, I feel bad the rest of that day. I want you to know, preacher, that we love you, we appreciate you. Some of us just don't get around to shaking your hand, but I will. Thank you. That's very kind, Charlie. I really appreciate that. I just want you to know I'm feeling okay. Okay? I'm, uh, I was starting to get. I was doing a, like, like an internal checkup there for a couple of seconds after he said that. I wonder if he knew something I didn't. But, uh, we don't have to charge you extra for that second service, do we? No, that's, that's true. Okay. Well, thank you. That's very kind. I appreciate that. And it's, it's an honor for us to, to serve here. It, it really is. I mean, I was thinking about this, this this morning, walking through the lobby and seeing everybody doing something. Everybody's busy getting th things ready for the, the service to begin. It, it's just a, we, we've got an amazing group of folks here at Crossroads. It's, it truly is a privilege to, to be here. Um, I, I can't say enough about that. And I, and I tell others about that, too. I'm not just saying that to you. I tell other pastors about that, too. And, and when I see what they're, what they're going through and what other churches are going through, we truly are blessed you are blessed to have a church like Crossroads Baptist Church. You really are. Let's uh, stand and be dismissed in prayer and ask God to bless us. Brother Greg, if you would, dismiss us from where you are, Pardon, please. Amen. God bless you. We'll see you tonight at 6.